Good morning. Guys, it's good to see you. I've run into a couple Green Bay Packer fans today who said, you traitor, what are you doing? And so I need you to know, Packers are still my go-to team, but I figure if I'm gonna live here for the next 15, 20 years, I need to embrace the Seahawks. Even though in their history, the Packers have won at least twice as many games as the Hawks, right? But I have embraced it and I will be cheering them on. And Friday night with the Green Bay Packers did not help me. All right, so I'll just leave it like that. So here's the deal, February, 2013, there's this couple who is walking their dog on their rural property when they notice something unusual. Uh, they, they notice that there is this rusty metal can that's partially buried under a tree. Now, they've been through this area before, many times walked the area, but this specific time they notice this can. And so the husband walks over, starts to kind of dig it out. To his astonishment, he found it was filled with old gold coins dating from the mid to late, mid to late 1800s. Well, in the days that followed, you can imagine they went back to that site over and over, continued to dig, and eventually unearthed eight metal cans filled with just over 1,400 rare U.S. gold coins. And they were in mint condition. Many of them appeared to never even have circulated. Right? It's called the Saddle Ridge Hoard because Saddle Ridge is the area the property was located on. The face value ended up being $28,000, but the market value was just around $10 million. Wow. Uh, you can imagine why now you see me walking around Timberlake with a metal detector. <laughs> you know, I'm hoping. But $10 million, that's almost enough money to get you a condo here on the east side. And... Um, <laughs> And, and experts came up with all sorts of theories on how these coins got there and why they were there. But the mystery remains unsolved. Uh, the couple that discovered it, they didn't want their family and friends to know, so they still to this day go by the aliases of John and Mary. Well, here's the deal. When someone finds money, wins money, inherits money, earns lots of money, what we tend to say about those individuals is they are living the dream. Well, 3,000 years ago, King Solomon of Israel was doing just that. He was living the dream. He had accumulated lots and lots of resources. In fact, he writes about it in one of the books that he authored. Here's what Solomon says. He says, I collected great sums of silver and gold. I had everything a man could desire. Rich, powerful, famous. When we hear words like that, all of us have an image that come to our mind. All of us think of someone, rich, powerful, famous. I could be that person. For me, the image that comes to my mind, does anybody re remember the A-team from back in the 1980s? Mr. T, right? Has all the gold and the, the silver. And he's got diamonds. To me, this is the epitome of looking wealthy, being famous. Anybody remember his, his uh, actor name? B.A. Baracus, Yeah. Bad attitude, Baracus is what he went by. My son, Jaden, if, if he was talking about this guy, Jaden's only 18, he'd say he has serious drip, right? But that was King Solomon. He's living the dream. And yet he says, what's most valuable to me is not the money I have. It's not the yachts that I have. It's not the cryptocurrency that I have. He says, what's most valuable to me is the wisdom that God gave me. Here, here's what he writes about wisdom. Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. For wisdom is more profitable than silver and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Now, I read this and I'm like, really, Solomon? It's more valuable than riches, more valuable than diamonds. I mean, it's like he's using hyperbole. He's trying to create a dramatic effect, but he's actually not using hyperbole. He's making a really great point. He's saying it doesn't matter how much money or how much possessions you have. If you don't have the wisdom on how to manage them appropriately, you're gonna find yourself under a lot of financial pressure. It doesn't matter how much fame or power you have. If you don't have wisdom in knowing how to navigate the temptations that come with fame and power, you're gonna find yourself shipwrecking your life. It doesn't matter how, much, how many people you know or how many numbers are stored in your cell phone. If you don't have wisdom on how to interact with people and you can't read social cues and you don't have emotional intelligence, the truth is uh, you are not going to have many real friends. And so King Solomon 
very clearly says at the end of the day, wisdom is more valuable than money. It's more valuable than possessions. It's more valuable than all the things that we typically pursue. And then he reiterates his point over and over and over throughout the book of Proverbs. And in order to connect with his readers, what he does is he personifies wisdom as the wisdom were a person. He talks about wisdom as a woman who's constantly calling out, constantly trying to watch over us, constantly trying to guide us and, 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 and keep us moving in the right direction. So Solomon writes this, he says, don't turn your back on wisdom for she will protect you. Love her and she will guard you. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her and she will honor you. Wisdom protects us. It guards us, it leads us. Where does it lead us? To a great life. It helps us avoid all types of heartache. Now, obviously we can't avoid every heartache this world has to offer. It's part of life that we're gonna go through loss, we're gonna experience sickness, disease. There's gonna be change that has all sorts of ripple effects. There's gonna be uncertainty and fear. There are a lot of challenges. There's a lot of difficulty, a lot of pain in this life that is totally unavoidable. However, so much of what we deal with is, is avoidable. As you can imagine, as, as a pastor, I sit with people all the time who are trying to figure out how to pick up the broken pieces of their life based on decisions that they made. Sometimes it's based on decisions other people made and they experience the shrapnel of those decisions. But all of us have stories of times that we've had to sift through the ashes of destruction that was caused by our words or by our actions. And what happens is when we choose to ignore wisdom, when we choose to reject wisdom, when we choose to not pursue wisdom, inevitably, we are gonna end up with regrets. And so today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna launch a three-week teaching series simply called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. And over the next few weeks, we're gonna look at different ways that you and I can pursue wisdom. And it's important that we're all on the same page as we get started. So let's just make it very, very clear that knowledge and wisdom are very different. Knowledge is possessing information. Our, wisdom, our, our world is drowning in information. If you want knowledge, if you want information on pretty much any topic, all you need to do is go to, you know, search it out on Google or you go to a conference or you read a book or you, you pull up YouTube videos. I just did it this past week, right? I recently bought a house in Redmond and so this past week uh, decided to take on the project of replacing all of my high bay lights in my garage. All right, so I have six of these lights. They're old school, as you can tell. I mean, it's dust all over them. And uh, I decided I was gonna replace these old industrial lights with LED lights because it is gonna look bright. It is gonna be clean, right? And, and I'm not an electrician, so this is not like a simple, straightforward project. So uh, I, I, I go to YouTube to, to figure out how to do this. And, and in order to change the lights, I had to go into the junction box Right, And I had to uh, unhook the wires, but then install an outlet. Because it's not as simple as like taking wires and the new ones. I literally had, because they plug into an outlet. So I had to install outlets. So I go to YouTube and I get my, whiz, uh, my, my information and my knowledge. And after I had put in my first outlet, I decided to test it. And I plugged in a lamp and ladies and gentlemen, it worked. <laughs> For three seconds and then smoke. <laughs> Smoke starts coming from the connection. And wow, you know, there it is. Fight, flight, or freeze, right? Type of responses. I think I was doing all of them. I was pants. I ran over to the uh, breaker box. I turned off the breaker. Then because the outlet is like on the ceiling, now I panic. What happens if there's something that happened in the ceiling. So I have to get out a ladder. I go in the attic. I'm walking on the beams trying to find out where the outlet was to make sure it's not smoking. It was all out chaos. And then I called my dad and he said, why are you calling me? You need to call an electrician. And um, <laughs> I, I, I called a friend of mine who's an electrician. And that's when I learned you cannot use 240 volt breaker on lights that need 120 volts. Now, I share that story because my insurance agent does not go to this church, right? <laughs> but here's the deal. I had access to information. I had access to knowledge. But I was working with electricity. I have no experience in that. I should have consulted with someone who does that on a regular basis. There's almost no arena in life in which knowledge and information is enough. We need wisdom. And what wisdom does is it requires us to slow down. It requires us to ask questions. It requires us to talk to those who've been there and done that. It requires us to think through the consequences of whatever decisions we're making. So knowledge is possessing information. That's easy to do. 
Wisdom is learning to make good decisions based on the information available. The biggest regrets in our life have very little to do with, I didn't have enough knowledge. I didn't have enough information. Most of our biggest regrets almost always have to do with a lack of wisdom. We got caught up in the moment. We didn't think through the repercussions of our actions. And now we're living with those consequences. Now I've heard wisdom defined in many, many ways. All of them are great definitions for the most part, right? But my favorite definition of wisdom goes like this, that wisdom is living today with tomorrow in mind. Wisdom is understanding that all of life is connected. It's understanding that what happened in the past is somehow connected to the present and that what's happening in the present is somehow connected to the future. All of life's connected. So what happens is a wise person looks at their life like one big puzzle and they realize every single piece matters, right? Wise people realize that every relationship matters. They, they realize that every job matters. They realize that the way I talk and the way I live, it matters. Every season matters. I can't downplay this season because it's not my favorite season. Every season matters. It all fits together at the end of the day. And so a wise person is someone who's able to make decisions that fit into the bigger picture of their life and what they want their life to eventually look like. They, they make decisions today with tomorrow in mind. That's what wisdom is. And what's interesting is if you look at the way the, 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 the writings of the scriptures kind of portray life, rarely do, is scripture all about yes and no answers. It's, it's like, this is right, this is wrong. Sometimes we certainly see that. But most of the scriptures, especially the ancient scriptures, uh, which we would call the Old Testament, most of the scriptures, when it talks about life, talk about uh, our decisions as wise and foolish in making uh, decisions that, of course, would, would be wise. And the reason why is God's not simply interested in telling us what to think. God is way more interested in telling us how to think so that when we're confronted with challenges and temptations and difficulties in life, we can know how to navigate them. Now, God's given us a free will. When it comes to making decisions, we have lots of options in front of us. We don't have to live with paranoia when making decisions, but it is important that we know how to think so that we, <laughs> forgot those were on there, that we don't unintentionally uh, unintentionally create a life in which uh, it looks different um, than, than where we want to eventually end up, right? And this is why we need to pursue wisdom. And the way we pursue wisdom is we start to pay attention to how life works. We consider how different decisions lead to different outcomes. We pay attention to patterns, what are the patterns that lead to a healthy relationship? What are the patterns that lead to an unhealthy relationship? What are the patterns that lead to a great financial security? What are the patterns that lead to financial destruction? What, what are the patterns that lead to a lot of regret? What are the patterns that lead to very few regrets? We study patterns and then we move in that direction. So wisdom is living today with tomorrow in mind. Now, I grew up uh, in a home where neither of my parents drank alcohol. Now, Timberlake uh, Church, we are not anti-alcohol. I've been open about the fact that uh, I do drink alcohol. Um, I do obviously try to be very responsible in doing that, but I drink alcohol, but my parents did not. Now, some people, they don't drink because they don't like the taste or they morally, they object to it for some reason. My parents, that was not their reason. The reason my parents chose not to drink alcohol is my dad grew up in a home where when his father would drink alcohol, uh, he was an alcoholic and he became very abusive, verbally, physically. And so my father wanted to change the course of the family tree based on his experience, based on what he saw. He just said, I just don't want to, to drink. And then my mom supported him in that decision. And you know, it's not like they shun their kids who, who drink alcohol, but that, that was their decision based on experience. That's called wisdom. A wise person pays attention to patterns and then makes choices uh, to avoid repeating them. Now, a foolish person isn't like that, right? A foolish person does the opposite because at its core, foolishness is living for the moment. Foolish person isn't thinking about the, the big picture of their life. They're doing what they want. They're saying what they want. They're going where they want to go and they're never thinking about the future consequences. And think about a, a foolish person. They're not a bad person. They're just immature. They lack perspective. For a fool, waiting is never an option. The, the only consequences to them that matter are the immediate consequences. So if you tell a foolish person, hey, listen, that path you're on is not leading to where you think it's gonna go. Guess what? They're gonna keep going down the path because it feels right in the moment. 
And King Solomon writes about how a fool responds to lady wisdom. Now in the scriptures, wisdom is never personified as a man. It's always a woman, right? But lady wisdom says this, I called to you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice and rejected the correction I offered. When we choose to not pursue wisdom, when we ignore wisdom, when we reject wisdom, when we don't look for patterns, when we think that we're the exception to the rule, what inevitably happens at some point is we will end up with regret. And if you think about it, so many of the regrets we have in life are the decisions we made in the moment that were rooted in pleasure, comfort, or gratification. Immediate gratification is almost always gonna work against wisdom because wisdom is big picture thinking. Wisdom is looking at the entire picture instead of just a piece of the picture or a puzzle. Wisdom realizes every piece matters. And it's easy to believe that we only end up with regrets, right? If we do something big and dramatic, something that maybe we would categorize as sin. But in reality, our biggest regrets are often just a series of little decisions that led us to a certain point. And that's the way Satan traps us. And even though we're a church, I know that sometimes the word Satan just kind of feels like some concept out there, kind of fictional. We hear the word devil, right? But we, we, I think this is another way Satan traps us. The beginning to believe it is not real, right? So we picture this red cartoon character you know, with, with horns and a pitchfork and someone leading a homeowner's association. And we think, well, that's, that's the devil. But, but Satan is a very real spiritual being. He's an evil force that constantly is working against good. So Satan doesn't have the ability to create. So what does he do? He counterfeits and he distorts and he twists and he perverts everything God makes. God creates truth. Satan perverts truth. God creates entertainment. Satan perverts entertainment. God creates happiness. Satan perverts happiness. God creates animals. All Satan can do is pervert. That's why we have cats, right? But here, here's the deal. One day, Jesus is talking to his audience about Satan, and here's what he says. He says, he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He's a liar. He's a fraud. He's very, very cunning. He's, he's deceitful. Now, someone who's really good at deceiving others doesn't have these big, elaborate lies that are just easy to detect. No, someone who's good at deceit is... Constantly sharing half-truths. Someone who's good at the seed is kind of drawing someone in. They use psychological games. They, they use uh, appeal to emotions. They have confirmation bias that they'll use. They, um, they, they're very good with timing. They try to take people off guard. And this is why I say that our biggest regrets are usually not the result of just one time decision. It's, it's a result of so many little decisions that led up to that moment. A couple weeks ago, I was watching a documentary on casinos. And I don't judge anybody who goes to casinos, right? Just remember to give to Jesus if you win. But in the United States, in the United States, players lose around $30 billion alone on slot machines. $30 billion. How does that happen? How does anyone play a game that they know at the end of the day, I'm only gonna really win a small percentage of the time? Well, it's actually very strategic. When casinos started putting slot machines in, uh, you know, for people to play, it was kind of a sideshow to the main event, which was the table games. So you bring your uncle along, he doesn't play cards games, and so he's out by himself uh, playing, you know, playing slot machines. And then what ended up happening is they started experimenting by grouping uh, slot machines together. And getting people to have conversations, getting people to talk and putting them in high traffic areas. And they became more and more intentional to add sounds and add lights and even carpet seemed exciting. If you look down the carpet, it's like, oh, that's a winning looking carpet, right? They're just very intentional to get us to play longer and spend more. Well, one of the most creative things that casinos have done with slot machines to somehow bring in $30 billion a year is they've learned how to, to disguise losses as wins. In other words, you wager a dollar in over a series of plays, you may get 95 cents back. So you feel like you're winning, but in reality, you're still losing. You may get 80 cents back. So you've lost 20 cents, but there's a psychology of like, I'm winning. I'm winning. I won that one. I won that one. 
Guys, Satan's great scheme is to rob us of our joy, our passion, our purpose, our happiness. And when we choose to live for the moment and live for our comfort and live for our pleasure and live for our satisfaction, Satan has ways of making it feel like we're winning. But in reality, we're slowly losing. And if we are not aware of this, what will happen is we will get to the end of our life and we'll realize I'm bankrupt. I'm broke. I've lost. So as we go through life making decisions, instead of simply asking the question, is this right or is this wrong? Because so many of the things we deal with are just not right or wrong issues. The question that wise people ask is, where is this decision leading me? How does this decision fit into the big picture of my life? How does this decision move in the direction that I want my life to go? It's a very different question than foolish people ask. Foolish people are obsessed with questions like, well, is it legal, right? Is it moral, is it permissible? They're living for the moment. The foolish person is asking, how close can I get to the line without going over? How far can I go without being considered immoral or unethical? How, how much debt can I accumulate before I feel like I need to ask for another raise? But people who are looking at the big picture, people who see all of life is connected, people who are living today with tomorrow in mind, ask a different question. They ask, where is this decision leading me? Not is it consensual? Not did the bank say I was pre-improved? Not was I invited to participate? Not does it feel right? Where is this decision leading me? I'm gonna say it again. So many of the decisions we make are not moral and ethical, right or wrong issues, right? Where should I live? What should I do for a career? Should I put my kids in public school or private school? Should I homeschool them? Should I buy a new car or a used car? What should I do with my free time this weekend? And I don't want any of us to be paranoid. God gives us so much freedom in making decisions, but we actually need to learn to say, hey, I got a big picture of what I want my life to look like. And I have to ask, where is this decision leading me? This takes time. It takes effort. It requires us to seek out people with life experience. And I know we, we lie to ourselves and we're like, well, I'm good at making decisions. Just look at my life. Guys, we're terrible. We're human beings. We've got confirmation bias. We've got emotional impulses. There's social pressures at play. Uh, we all live in echo chambers. At some point, we have to realize I have blind spots. I don't even know what they are because they're blind spots. Therefore, I have to seek out wisdom from people who've been there and done that. From people, when I look at the pattern of their life, say, that's where I want my life to end up. That means we have to slow down. We have to think about the big picture of our life on a regular basis and then make decisions accordingly. And King Solomon assures us, he says this, wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. A tree of life. It's a tree of life. Do you want life in your marriage? Do, do you want life in your finances? Do you want a career that feels alive? Do you want a relationship with your kid that feels alive? Do you, do you want for your faith to feel alive? Then every one of the, the decisions we make in life, at some point, we have to stop and slow down and say, this matters. We have to be guided by wisdom. Now, if you've checked out, if, if you for some reason, have not been tracking, maybe you're thinking about the game later on, whatever. Do not miss what I'm about to say next. This is so, so important. We make our decisions and then our decisions make us. We make decisions on what to eat and then what we eat impacts us. I do my best to eat healthy, I really do. And then I show up to Timberlake and I see donuts <laughs> and I see all this food. And I'm like, God, please, Please, guys, we make decisions and decision, we make decisions on who we hang out with and then who we hang out with begins to shape us. We make decisions on what we watch, what we listen to. And then what we watch or listen to begins to form us. And we say, well, come on, I'm an adult, I'm mature. I don't, it doesn't shape me that much. Come on, we, we're careful what our kids listen to and watch. But at some point we lie to ourselves and think, oh, that doesn't impact me anymore. We make decisions on how we spend time and then how we spend time begins to form us. And the reason we downplay it is we're just like, ah, it's just a little decision. It's just a little moment. It's not that, that, that big of a deal, but come on, it fits into the bigger picture of our life. And what happens in the past is connected to the present. What happens in the present is connected to the future. And I want so badly for us to understand this. We make decisions and then decisions make us. And if we downplay this, if we miss this, if we can't get this through our heads, what's gonna happen is we're gonna end up you know, at the final days of our life and we're gonna have deep regrets. It's gonna be too late. 
the Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh created an oil painting in 1890. It goes by two titles. It goes by Sorrowing Old Man and At Eternity's Gate. And the painting is meant to depict an elderly individual, right? It's got a, a, just a very somber background, but elderly individual at the end of their life agonizing over decisions they made, coming to grips with the fact that he, he doesn't have much time left. And it's so fascinating because Van Gogh painted this just two months before he died. One day at the end of our lives, we're gonna be sitting in a chair or we're gonna be laying in a bed and we're either gonna have our hands extended in worship towards the heaven, just being grateful for the life that we lived or we're gonna be agonizing with regrets that we're carrying with us to the grave. And just like you, this idea of getting to the end of my life with deep regret it haunts me. I don't want to be overwhelmed someday with a bunch of what ifs. I want to be driven with wisdom. But here's the thing about wisdom. I can't just expect it to happen in my life. I need to seek it out. I need to pursue it. It's one of the things that are unique about being human. If we don't pursue wisdom, we're going to end up with regrets. Animals don't have regrets. Right? You never see a National Geographic documentary where a zebra, a, a lion uh, attacks a zebra and begins to eat it. And then you just see this body language of this lion where it looks like it's remorse, filled with remorse over what it did. Right? All it did was respond to instinct. As humans, we are different. We have this internal moral compass. We have this orientation toward a life that is meaningful and deeply spiritual. And if you're currently living with regrets as an employee, or as an employer, or as a friend, as a husband, as a wife, as a child, as a parent, I want you to know you can begin living with wisdom. It doesn't erase what's happened in the past, but you can begin to move towards a better future. It is never too late to start down a new path. God never works with what could have been or should have been. He works with what is. We can right now, today, begin pursuing wisdom. We can begin learning to ask the question of how does this fit into the bigger picture of my life? We can begin to say, hey, here's where I want my life to end up and then make decisions accordingly. This is what I love about groups at Timberlake Church. When we get in a group and just in a few weeks, we're gonna be launching our group. So right now we're in the sign-up mode, but in a few weeks as we launch, here's the reality. We're saying, I want to do life and be surrounded with people who are moving in the same direction that I am because I think it's gonna help me. I think it's gonna help shape my values, help shape my beliefs, right? Right now, today, we can begin making it a practice to look for patterns in the lives of people that we respect and we honor and say, man, I want my life in the, moving in the same directions. So when it comes to regrets, God can redeem them. And he does this not by asking us to try harder, not by uh, causing us to have amnesia and forget about the things that we've done. He actually moves us to a place where we stop and reflect and reevaluate and repent and then turn in a different direction. And although the regrets in our life are very painful, they can also be very clarifying. They can help us to resolve to live differently. Our greatest moments of heartache can lead to a greater, our greatest moment of motivation. Regret can lead to change. Everybody responds to regret differently. Some just kind of dismiss it and try not to think about it and they don't want to think about the hurt. They don't want to think about the pain. They just dismiss it. Others are just burdened down by it. They fall into despair. They're like the painting that Van Gogh put together. Others have regrets and they pause and they reflect and they come up with a different framework for how to live differently and they conclude, I'm going to start making better decisions. I'm going to go down a different path. And that's what I challenge you to do. Right, the Apostle Paul, whose writings we look at almost every week at Timberlake Church, this is what he did. He participated in the killing and persecution of Christians. Then he has an encounter with Jesus that changes him. And he's very aware of his past. He, he, he for the rest of his life, lived with the awareness that, hey, I am the chief of sinners. That's what he called himself. But he used that reality to fuel his mission. He spent the rest of his life traveling thousands of miles, bringing the good news of Jesus to as many people as possible. He went from working to destroy the church to becoming one of the greatest leaders in the history of the church. 
That's the message of the cross. It's a message of redemption. So how I wasted money in, in the past and began to shipwreck my financial future, man, that doesn't have to define me. How I destroyed my first marriage does not have to define me. How I treated that person in that season of my life does not have to hold me back. I can experience the freedom, uh, uh, the freedom in this life because Jesus forgives, redeems, and restores. And it's such a life-changing reality that Jesus himself refers to it in a conversation he was having with a religious leader as being born again. It's like you get a new life. It's like the old things are gone and new things have come. And I'm not saying this to hype you up. I'm not saying it because it feels like a great way to end a message. I'm telling you, this is what Jesus does. And the greatest thing Satan wants to do is create so much shame in our life that it cripples us, but Jesus wants to bring redemption. Regardless of where you're at today, I want you to know it's possible to begin making better decisions and having fewer regrets. And over the years at Timberlake Church, we have watched story after story after story of individuals who said, man, I was going this direction. I was making these decisions. It was not leading to where I wanted to be. And I had to make some, some correction. And I had to begin to seek out wisdom and move in a different direction. And that's Sarah's story. I want you to check this out. Hey, I'm Sarah, and I've been attending Timberlake for 10 years. I grew up in a little town across the water called Gig Harbor, Washington. I was raised in a family that was divided. My mom was a Christian, and my dad wanted nothing to do with the Lord. I think I saw in my mom a patience and a kindness and a generosity. I saw how she was living, and I wanted that for myself. I became a Christian around 12. Then my, my faith got real in college. I moved to Seattle in 97 uh, to go to UW. It was really interesting to see the kind of choices I made for the next few decades. After college, you know, I got married and I did just enough to call myself a believer, but not enough to have a really deep relationship with the Lord. We were living in Queen Anne. Took a trip to um, visit some family in Nashville and came home and I was like, I feel like I could live out, like outside the city, which is crazy talk. Die hard Seattle. And next thing you know, um, I did a search for homes built before 1940. And this one house popped up just up the road from Timberlake. Started looking around for churches and uh, had heard a few good things about Timberlake and, and came down here I had been married 16 years, got divorced, and I, I think I kind of got to the end of myself. Like, how is this going? All the things I've been plugging into feel like not reliable sources of, of power and battery. And I basically turned my back on the Lord. I walked away from my faith in that season. There's really nothing great that comes from divorce. But I will say, if you let it humble you, it can be something that teaches you a lot about yourself. And then you start seeking answers. And I think that's when I finally got to the end of myself and thought, I need to let the Lord into all of the areas of my life. What do I have to lose? That's how it felt. When we got divorced, I had stopped going to church for a little while. When I returned to Timberlake, it was so funny to kind of compare the way I had felt sitting in church when I was angry at the Lord and the way I felt when I was really choosing to be there. I was just done being one foot in, one foot out. So I started coming back to church with a different mindset, that it wasn't just checking a box. and was like hungry. I, I signed up for divorce care classes, because why wouldn't I? And I'm watching this, you know, these videos and, and, and getting to know all these people. It, it felt so life-giving. As I was diving back in, my anger with the Lord really just went away. And what was left was my own accountability for my own decisions and actions. And I think about the Lord created us. He created me. He is like the engineer. And when I was not following the Lord, I was in pursuit of freedom. And the irony is, I didn't have any freedom. I thought that God would be all these rules. And, and He's our creator, so He knows how we operate best. And now, I mean, it's just, it's peaceful and it's joyful.
and I didn't have either of those. I could kind of fake those things because I think we all know those are virtues, so we all want to pretend that we're happy and we want to pretend that we have peace. In past experiences, it can feel like you have to come with this perfect life or you have to be in a place where all your bad decisions are behind you. And the reality is that's just not, that's not real life. It was, it was an easy place to be open and honest. Since deciding it's time for me to give up my whole life to the Lord, I don't know, it's, it's been kind of amazing. And that's not because circumstances have changed. Jesus um, is a refiner and he refines us to be more like him. It's just funny how you're the same exact person, but your heart's different. We appreciate Sarah sharing her story. I was saying, hey, after my divorce, I started making decisions that eventually I realized are not leading me to where I wanna go. So I turned around. When I think about the picture of my life, I adopted a definition of success years ago that has become that picture. And that is, I want for the people who know me best to love and respect me the most. And for me personally, if that's gonna happen, then Jesus has to shape every area of my life. So shape my character. Help me grow in compassion and generosity in love and kindness and forgiveness. Like, Jesus has to help me in these areas. Jesus has to take what I have and say, hey, I'm gonna redeem it. I'm gonna make something of it, but you gotta work in cooperation with me, Dave. And I'm never gonna be perfect, right? Which is why I need Jesus. But maybe you've showed up to environments like this for a while. Maybe you've been attending Timberlake Church and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. I wanna give you that opportunity to say, hey, God, today I wanna change the direction of my life by surrendering my life to you. Because that's what happens. When we decide to surrender our life to Jesus, we're basically saying, I'm stepping off the throne of my life. I'm in control now. I do what I want. I say what I want. I go where I want, right? I'm stepping off the throne and I'm inviting Jesus onto the throne. And I'm gonna do my best to, to shape my life in, in the direction of Jesus. I wanna follow the Jesus way. We're not always gonna get it right, granted. But we're gonna continue to pursue the Jesus way. And over the coming weeks and months and years, right? You can learn more and more about how to do that. But if you're at a place today where you're saying it's time, it's time I surrender my life to Jesus. I recognize I am a sinner. I am in need of grace. I wanna be made new. Then as I pray this final prayer, just in your heart, would you just say, Heavenly Father, today's my day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of wisdom. And all over this auditorium, those watching, those listening online, are people in desperate need of wisdom for different situations and different circumstances. We're all in different seasons. And so I do pray, give us the wisdom that we need for our unique circumstances and then give us courage to do what we know we're supposed to do. And then Lord, for those today who wanna to surrender their life to you, those today who are stepping off the throne and inviting you onto the throne, I pray may it be a mark day. May it be a, a day in which lives are completely turned around, moving in a different direction. So at the end of their life, they don't have a bunch of what ifs but they've done their best to live in a way that reflects you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. But before you go, please be sure to bookmark this page so that you can find us again next week. And are you looking for a way to get engaged and join a team? The online chat engagement team is a role that anyone and everyone can do, and it's simple. Engage with people, create an environment where people are free to be themselves, and more importantly, open to receive the truth of Jesus. And if you're interested in joining this team and becoming part of what God is doing through Timberlake Online, please let me know on your connection card. Links can be found in chat, and I'll see you here next week at online.timberlakechurch.com.